So I want to welcome you to the Center for Business Spring Accounting and Business Lecture Series. Before we um, begin, I'd like to introduce you to our one of our ABC co-chairs. Um, I'm not sure if you all know, but Connor Reagan, who was our other co-chair, his grandfather died, and I, please send him your condolences and, and thoughts while he's going through this very difficult time. Um, he left to be with family today. Luckily, we have Lindsay Lane here, who is our, our guest speaker, or excuse me, who will introduce our guest speaker. Um, we do have two new co-chairs starting in the fall. Um, Elizabeth Deal, who's not able to be here today, and Pedro Correa, but he just won his tennis match. I'm told he'll be here shortly. So, um, it's your turn. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Lane, as you just heard. I'm the co-president in Accounting and Business Club. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the Spring Business Lecture Series in partnership with the Department of Athletics. This evening, we will be hearing from Jack Galati, serial entrepreneur of 43 companies worldwide. Born in India, Galati immigrated to the United States with his family in 1958 when he was 15 years old. He attended high school in New York City and then enrolled at the University of Minnesota. After, he received Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from the University of Minnesota in 1966. Like his father and grandfather before him, Galati had ambitions to become an entrepreneur. He acquired his first business in 1968 at the age of 26, and in the ensuing years, he bought, sold, and created 42 businesses. His companies in the United States and Europe have included Fidelity Technologies Corporation, Tele Alarm Group, Fidelity Investment Corporation, Safety Care Technologies, Stokesay Castle, and Allen All-Americans Professional Hockey Club in Dallas, Texas. Galati has received many honors over the years. President George H. W. Bush appointed him to the Small Business Advisory Committee of Federal Communications Commission. He was a delegate to the 1986 and 1995 White House conferences on small, small businesses appointed by President Reagan and Clinton. For six years, he served on the Board of Trustees of Chestnut Hill College in Philadelphia. In 2015, Chestnut Hill College honored Galati by giving him an honorary Doctor of Law degree. We would like to extend a thank you to Mr. Galati for taking the time to speak with us about his journey. As students at Chestnut Hill and young leaders today, let us give our full attention as we can only grow from our knowledge from Mr. Galati's experience. Please welcome Jack Galati. Well, Lizzie, I don't know what more can I add? You finished, you did it all. Thank you, thank you very kindly though. Good. Uh, it was so kind of them to invite me to speak to you people as much as I can. Uh, my talk will be around 50 minutes, 50 minutes, 5-0, and then I'll have about 10 minutes or so for question and answers. And then after that, I'll be sticking around till midnight. You can always uh, call me and let me know, okay? Uh, I want to talk to you about balancing business and family for true wealth and happiness. Uh, my philosophy has been is you need wealth to manage and to live comfortably. But equally important, if not more, you need family. It's your family that makes you what you are. It's your family that loves you always, doesn't matter how bad you are, or other way around, you will love them always. So th that's my topic, okay? Uh, I have retired three times, but I can't stay retired, so I'm still out here talking to you guys, okay? Every day for me is always a happy day, okay? Raise your hand if you're happy. Oh, everybody's happy, that's good, I like that. I like this stuff, man, this is my kind of team. All right, all right, so I can keep going then. Okay, I wrote a book called Serial Entrepreneur. And uh, that's this book here with my beautiful picture in the front. <laughs> yeah, see that? Slay. That's another 20 years younger. No, no, quite. Anyway, it's that. Then the back is my family. Like I mentioned to you, yes, you need wealth, but you need family more important uh, than the wealth. So always keep in mind your family. Okay. Uh, okay, and so why I wrote this book? I had five objectives. Number one, I wanted to address important questions that entrepreneurs face. This is, 
Where do I work? How do I get? Who do I marry? Where, where do I live? Those kind of things. And then how do I pay my bills? Which is important, believe me. Okay, describe uh, qualities of uh, successful entrepreneurs as to what it takes to do it. Offer lessons learned. In my 52 years of being an entrepreneur, owning many, many companies throughout the world, uh, and, uh, and I really mean throughout the world, world, and I'll explain that to you in a few minutes. Uh, and how do you handle business affairs? Importance of giving back, which is very important. Once you have a few dollars in your bank account, you need to take care of the next generation and your community and the like. Balancing work and family life. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit in the back end so that I can tell you how old I am and what do I do. In 1914, I mean 2014, I bought the Reading Royals. How many people do you know where Reading is up here? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that means majority of them don't know. Reading is a small, poor town in Berks County, which is about 42 miles from uh, Center City, Philadelphia. It used to be the wealthiest town in its heydays. Reading Railroad was the wealthiest company in its heydays. Some of you play Monopoly will know that Reading is the most expensive property on the Monopoly board. Why? Because they were the wealthiest. Okay. And uh, in um, 2014, I had retired. And I sold my companies, and I didn't have anything to do. I was enjoying my retirement life uh, in Florida. And all of a sudden, I get this brochure in the mail saying that the Reading Royals are for sale. But it also said the buyer is going to move the, the Reading Royals to Cleveland. And uh, my wife said, Jack, you know, Reading been good to you. You made some good money there. You can't let that happen because there's not much in Reading, per se, in terms of quality of life. They have plenty of people, plenty of good things, but they didn't have quality of life type of entertainment. So my wife said, Jack, you need to buy this team to keep it in Reading. That was the only reason I, I, I stepped up and I bought the team so I can keep it in Reading, and I kept it there till five years, 2019. I'll explain why I sold it. Then the hockey bug got me in the 2017. I bought another hockey team. Do you know, it's like one of those things. If you lose uh, millions on one hockey, you might as well lose two millions on two hockeys, <laughs> right? What the heck? I mean, it's only that way, you know? And uh, I told some of my friends here, they said, uh, Jack, why do you like hockey so much? I said, well, do you know how you make millions in hockey? Anybody knows? No? You start out with billions and you'll make millions. Believe me, you would. You know, you don't make any money in these things. Uh, sp sporting events are not for money, okay? Sporting events are for the fun of it, for your community, for giving back and all that kind of stuff. Yes, you want to make money, and that's why I bought Allen. I had no love for the city of Allen. In, this is in suburb of Dallas, very wealthy city, uh, but uh, I, I intend to make some money on it uh, uh, that basically is you make money when you sell because only very limited supply. You all know in business, it's a supply and uh, demand equation. If you, have, if you have a property that's limited in supply, you, you can call for a better, better price. If you have too much supply, then you can't get the price you want. So that, that was my philosophy for buying this. My name is Jack Galati. How many of you think I was born in Italy? <laughs> One, two, three, four. Well, to fool you all, I was born in India. Okay. Uh, Galati is also a very common name in India. So you guys know now. In, the, in my old days, when I was in college, when I go bar hopping, these girls would come up to me and they say, oh, you're Italian. Yeah, baby, I'm Italian. Come on, baby, let's talk. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to care about it. It wasn't important. So, I said, so the point I'm making here is that pick your battles, pick your important part. It wasn't important where I come from. What was important was how beautiful she was and if she liked me or made sure she liked me. Those were my days. But anyway, I used to enjoy those days. Fortunately, I had a very strong parental influence on me. My mom and dad were super people, uh, and uh, they brought us to America. Uh, India in 1940s, very briefly, 
was when the World War, World War was ending. Uh, India was split between Pakistan and uh, Hindus. Hindus moved south to India, and Muslims moved uh, to north to be in Pakistan, and millions upon millions got killed. Literally millions got killed. And uh, trains were overloaded and all that kind of stuff. People were walking on donkeys and horses and walk and walk and walk. My family at that time, unfortunately, was in the northern part. We had to move uh, south. Fortunately, my uncle was living in the south, so we were able to find our way to get back down there, and we survived. But then um, my father, uh, he was in uh, liquor business. He had uh, about seven or nine liquor stores. Well, when India was ruled by the British, liquor was no problem. But when uh, the Indians got uh, by the Indian uh, government, basically Gandhi and Nehru, who were the, the, the non-drinkers, they banned all liquors and they confiscated his, uh, his uh, liquor stores and didn't compensate them for that. So you can appreciate tough times do come. And sometimes people come not because of your creation, but by the nature of the event that happened. So my father lost all his uh, liquor stores and uh, he was penniless and he had to leave India to travel. And he was a good enough, a smart enough entrepreneur. He traveled all over Asia and Europe and all that. And then he finally settled in America as the best place for him to be at. So just think how fortunate we are all here that we have a great country to live in, great country to make our, our remarks, great countries to enjoy our opportunities, and uh, the, the, we, we can all make it. Okay, and then he settled to America and. Uh, then he brought his family to America. I went to high school in New York City. And then, um, well, I'd gone to high school in India too, but at 16, I graduated from Indian high school, but it didn't mean anything. But then I went to high school in New York City. Okay, and then uh, I learned to be an American. What, what does that mean, really? What really means is, you know, many of our foreigners never get out of their own uh, little hub that to live in, be Italian, be Irishman. You remember all those things. Uh, your parents uh, probably lived in the same house for the last 50 years or whatever, you know, kind of stuff. So, but uh, we, my parents, I think they were very smart. They spoke Hindi in, in their personal life, but outside that with us and uh, other, other people, they always spoke to us in English. Sometimes uh, broken English, but they did speak English because they want us to learn English and English customs and American customs and Americans' uh, way of saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and not just, uh, you know, keep your Indian customs on you, which helped me a lot, only because it allowed me to dis disseminate within the greater culture of America. Okay. Then what happened was I graduated from high school, and I was one of those rebel guys you may can imagine. I don't know some of you are not. I want to just get away, get away from home. Okay, so me and my friend said, okay, we are graduated from high school, we are the big shots around here and everything, we are going to go to Hollywood to be movie stars. <laughs> what a comment, eh? Two of us. And uh, my mother didn't like that at all. My mother did not like that at all. If some of you know old, old ladies from old countries, you can appreciate. To this day I visualize when my mother was crying when we were leaving in uh, 1958 uh, Ford. Okay, so, but uh, that's what I wanted to do. Like I said, I was a little bit of a rebel type of thing. I wanted to do things my way. Uh, and uh, so two of us left to go to Hollywood. We wanted to be the movie stars. Okay, as luck sometimes have things for you, as we were going through Wisconsin, our car broke down. Our car broke down in a small little town called Ashcott, Wisconsin. It had a truck stop had a bar, had a church. That's all it had. Nothing else. No lodging, no nothing. So we, so we rolled our car down to the, to, the, to the truck stop. And we said, what's the problem here? He said, son, your engine is blown. It's going to cost you $668.82. I still remember to the penny the number he was asking for. Of course, we didn't have that kind of money because my mother definitely didn't want me to leave. The last thing I could do was to call her and say, mom, I need some money because that would have been a disaster, at least to my ego. But long story short, we left our car there, and in those days, you could hitchhike fairly decently. This is in the 50s, 
So me and my friend put out a thumb, said, we want to we hitchhike. The first guy stopped over. He said, where are you guys going? We said, well, we want to go to Hollywood, California. He said, well, guys, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Minneapolis. I can take you there. So he said, fine. It's closer than uh, where we were in Wisconsin. So it's on our way. So I'll make the long story short, he, he picked us up and he dropped us off at the University Avenue, which is the, the fraternity row of the University of Minnesota. Just where he dropped us off, there was a sign in the window, it said room and board, $10 a week. $10 a week for room and board? Something must be wrong. What it was, the, all the brothers had gone home, so they just had the house mother there, and so she was, the rooms were all empty, so they put us there, okay? So, okay, that was nice. So we started to stay there for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, I should say, and then, uh, the, I, my, my friend wanted to keep going to Hollywood, and uh, you know, Minnesota is a pretty damn place in the summertime. The, the University of Minnesota is a campus on the river, Mississippi River, beautiful place, um, and uh, it has lots of lakes and you thing. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna go study at the university. So I said, okay, well, so I'll sign up. I did. So the summertime, they had two semesters. One and two. Well, summertime, at the first semesters, anybody could sign up and the tuition was the same. There was no such thing as out-of-state tuition, in-state tuition, and the like. Well, I signed up for my first semester. Now, the first semester finished. Now, the second semester was coming. I said, I don't want to go to Hollywood anymore because I don't have the money anymore. I didn't. I was penniless almost. Believe it or not, we used to keep uh, account by half a penny. You know who owes who half a penny. It was that bad sometimes. But anyway, I did what I could. So then the second semester started, and I, I went in and uh, uh, I signed up the forms, and it said Jack Galati, 1600 Hennepin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota. They said, oh, you're here. Yep, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a resident. Move on. We're going to charge you the residence tuition that was $89 a semester. $89 a semester. Do you know? The out-of-state residents were paying a few thousand dollars. So I just got locked out because I didn't lie. I just told them where I live. <laughs> didn't I? I mean, I didn't have to tell them the whole story. They didn't ask me that question, right? They asked me where you live. I told them 1600 Hennepin Avenue, which was the fraternity house of Delta Chi. So, so they signed me in. So the next time I started, and I kept going as an in-state tuition, uh, tuition person. But I tell you, they were good to me, they took care of me. In my later years, I took good care of them. You know, I was, I graduated in 66. I was the, what they call the 11th most achieved uh, graduate out of uh, University of Minnesota, which had a graduation of about 100,000 people. So they honored me and I appreciate that and I appreciated them. They were good to me, so I can't complain. Okay, I got my BA in mathematics. I decided I was gonna design computers so I went into computers were hot in those days. Because remember though, in those days, computers were this, this room full, okay? Uh, and so I designed computers for NASA and Department of Defense uh, for things. And then um, on one of my computer assignment was uh, based in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Culver City, California, which is a suburb of uh, LA. So I made it to Hollywood. <laughs> so my ambition came through, okay? Now let me tell you something. You guys are younger guys here. Some of the older guys, let me talk to them for a few minutes. In 60s, those were the wild times, my friend. You know, we had the Watts riots. We obviously had the Harlem riots and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the, it was a wild time, really. It really mean, you think we have bad now. It was really bad then. Uh, we lived in, a, in an apartment complex that had swimming pool in the middle and the rooms are on cross all, all four sides. And uh, boy, we used to have nude parties all night. That was the time of signs. And uh, in those days, close your ears, ladies, the ladies were allowed to go out topless. Man, oh man, those were the days, really. You know? I told you I was a wild guy. But that, that wasn't my fault that they were, that's what they were doing, but it was their problem. And, uh, <laughs> I won't bore you with it now, but uh, you know, then they used to have topless bars and all that kind of stuff. And so one time, we went to this pizzeria, 
okay? They must have had a lady who was probably in her 70s, her boob was hanging down to her belly button. I said, no, I can't take that. I can't take that, I'm too young for that stuff. So I decided to leave California, okay? That, but that was a true story, though, my like, gosh, yeah. I mean, you know, okay, you, you like beautiful women, I did too. Who doesn't, I should say? And the women like beautiful men too, so, right? Right, Lindsay? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what happened was, life was decent. I, w I had a nice job making decent money. I bought a car, beautiful suburb uh, convertible Mustang. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, my father was killed in a holdup in uh, New York City. Uh, that was tragic, obviously, and he was only 52 years old. Uh, and I regret that even to this date, because uh, I often say, if my father was around, I could have learned a lot more from him than I did on my own. I had to learn most of the things by my own bootstrapping. But unfortunately, this is an article that appeared in, uh, uh, in the New York Times, uh, and they gave away our home address and everything on that thing. So my mother was scared of shit now. She was afraid that these guys are gonna come after her now because they know where she lives. Because what, what happened was, my father and mother worked together in their store, and uh, when uh, they killed my father, my mother was there and she was watching the whole thing and now she was afraid that they may come after her and so she was scared as that could be. It's understandable. So I decided I'm gonna come back to East. So the closest job I could find was in uh, Bluebell, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, and uh, so I got to work for them. And so I decided to come back to, to Philadelphia to take care of my mother. Then, uh, I, 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 I just got the bugs, uh, bugs in me. To be very blunt with you guys, I invented a small mini computer and my company didn't like it. So I said, you, you're not my kind of company. So I left them and I started my own company. I started my first company at 26 and uh, purchased my last one at 75. Okay, you might ask me, what was your first company? I did not diddly about these things, but I did know that uh, the technology was being pirated very rapidly by the, our friends in China. We used to call them Chinese copies in those days. And uh, so I invented a process where we would uh, enclose these uh, circuitries in a box so they wouldn't be easy to camp campus. So, my, my question here being is, I bought the Allen American at 75. There's a never too early or too late to buy or start or uh, make a company, or grow a company for that matter. And by the way, when I say entrepreneur, does not mean you have to be in business for yourself. You, if you work with somebody, that's fine too, because you're an entrepreneur in that department. You know, if you work in the accounting department, you're an entrepreneur in that accounting department, it's your job to maximize efficiencies, to maximize your, your worth for, that, uh, for, your, for your employer. So it doesn't mean you have to be on your own. You could be anywhere. And my father used to say, Jack, you can't hold a job, and he was right, okay? And that's true, I couldn't hold a job. Because even when I buy my companies, after a while I'll get tired and I sell it, or dispose of it, or do whatever, okay? Um, you know, today is the opening day for the baseball 23 season, so I thought I'd tell you what my achievements have been. During these 44 companies, I've had three grand slams, two home runs, six singles and doubles, 31 strikeouts and walks, and I still own two. The point I'm trying to make here is, in life you'll have more strikeouts than grand slams. But when you hit grand slams, everybody cheers. When you strike out, ah, he's a bum anyway, so let him get out of there, you know? So I've, I had my, my share of strikeouts. And, uh, but as a lesson to you all, I never, never cheated anybody of any money I owed anybody. Sometimes I, I, owe money, I owe money to people, but I didn't have the money, so I would work out and negotiate a deal with them. I'll give you 10 cents on a dollar or a penny on a dollar or whatever, but I made the other guy hold, hold as much as I could. I never declared bankruptcy, I never, uh, uh, didn't pay my bank loans and that kind of stuff. So that gave me some credibility with the next guys, okay? Uh, the longest company I've owned is Fidelity Investment Corporation, which I formed in uh, 1977 at the age of 36. And 46 years later, I still own it and active. 
So as you can see, some of them do go last a long time. And I advise, every, and the, I use this company, by the way, as a uh, guinea pig if I want to do something. So I will advise almost everybody that you should start a company even though it has nothing in it, just a shell. Uh, because you never know when you might need an uh, organization to buy something or to do something and whatever. You, you can't just, if you want to buy something, you don't have, you need a structure to buy into it. So I always advise people to start one, all you need is to be just leave it on a piece of paper till the opportunity comes up and you're there to, to do something with it. Some of the companies I've owned, Fidelity Investment, Fidelity Technologies, FDL Technologies, Kraskosene, which is a Switzerland company. At one time, I had 10 companies in Europe uh, when I sold uh, my last company in Europe. And so all these companies I've owned, so Stokeshire Castle, some of you probably know Stokeshire Castle in Reading, Sunnybrook, which is in Pottstown, and of course, Reading Royals and Allen America. Uh, having all these companies, it occurred to me that, Jack, I was running ragged. I really was. You know, I was telling a friend from Ghana, I was appointed to be an uh, ambassador to, to help African countries do an uh, ambassador, I mean, do a transition from military rule to civilian rule. As you know, most of the countries in Africa were and still are ruled by the dictators and military and all that. Am I right? Hmm? You know, and uh, so I was, I was doing that. I was going to Africa all the time to advise these people, that people never succeeded, but that's okay. Um, but, uh, and then I had, like I said, 11, country, 11 companies in Europe, all the way from Switzerland to Hong Kong and all that. I was running ragged. So I used to, in fact, it used to be fun in a way, but uh, tiring as could be. I used to go to Europe for two weeks Pick, pick my bag, my attache case only, and I'll get on my Swiss Air, and uh, I would go to Switzerland, then go from there to different countries. And then I'd come to America, work in my office in uh, Fidelity Technologies in Reading for, for a week or two weeks, then go back again uh, uh, for two weeks. So and I had an apartment there, and everything was good. Uh, and uh, interesting things happened. In 2011, there was a big crash of Swiss Air going from New York to Geneva. That used to be called the UN Charter. And I was supposed to be on it. But God bless me, and I didn't go that week. I used to go every Monday. That used to be the Monday Charter for the, the, the for UN, because the UN, second European headquarter was in Geneva. And this was from JFK to Geneva. And fortunately, I was not on it. But 80% of the time, I was one of those guys, and I still am. Uh, I'm always a last minute, John. I, I can never get to any place on time. But today I was on time, though, Rita, wasn't I? <laughs> huh? Thank you. Thank you. She even feed me lunch or dinner, whatever it was. But it was wonderful. Thank you, Rita. Okay. So I've never been on time. So basically, in those days, we did not have TSA, didn't have the security clearances and all that kind of stuff. So I used to just run into the airport. The ticket girls knew me. The stewardesses knew me, and they would hop me through the back doors and into the airplane, ready to take off. And a couple more than once, the stewardesses would announce, oh, Mr. Glad is on board, we can leave now. <laughs> Literally true. Okay, so I used to do that. So then I said to myself, Jack, you're running ragged, you can't do this stuff. So I decided, and that's a good advice for you all, to advise to create a board of advisors. I said, these people, like I told you, my dad had died. He didn't have to advise me. So I, I, I sought out four guys that were related to my business, but they were a heck of a lot more smarter than I was because they've been there, they've done it, okay? So I, I, so I, I sat down and identified what kind of people I want, and uh, so I went after those people. And, and if you ask other people that are smarter than you are, and it's not a money mangle for these people. They've been there. They have all the money you can think of. But they want to help a genuine person, entrepreneur, small guy, young guy, whatever. But the key part is you have to be genuine. Meaning, if you ask them for advice and it's good, follow it. Just don't say, I know better. Why have them there then? Okay, these people, like I hired, not hired, I retained uh, Ed Meese, 
Ed Meese was Attorney General uh, for the United States under President Reagan. He was President Reagan's right-hand man. Then I hired General Jack Vesey. General Jack Vesey was Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff at the time. There's a small bit of information on him, which I think uh, you will enjoy. He's the only man that ever signed up as an enlisted GI and rose to be the Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff. So that means it doesn't matter where you start. It's matter how you progress and how up high you can go. There has never been a uh, Chief of Staff that did not go to the Academy, be it Army, Air Force, Marine, whatever. He was the only man that ever did that. Uh, he used to say, um, okay, he, he served about 42 years in the military, and he said he relocated 44 times. So what that means is you got to be ready to go wherever the duty calls. Now, some of you may not want that, and there's nothing wrong with it. My sons don't want it. They don't want to travel. They, they, they'd much rather stay at home. I have three sons. They're all within a 40-minute drive of each other. One is in Collegeville, one is in Gilbertsville, one is in Lehigh Valley. They don't want to go anywhere. That's fine. Same thing with my grandchildren. They don't want to go anywhere. But in most entrepreneurs, you want to go. That's just the nature of the beast of an entrepreneur. But it doesn't mean you can't succeed uh, without having to go. There's a small story on Jack Vesey that I will just tell you. Uh, when uh, President Reagan was running against uh, Mr. Carter, President Carter, and uh, the, it was projected that Mr. Carter would win his re-election, but he lost. Okay, so Reagan comes in, uh, two, two weeks later, there's, there's this, he appoints his cabinet and all that kind of stuff, or, or do a, ca a makeshift cabinet. And uh, so, the, so he asked uh, his, sta his staff, okay, um, who do we want to be the chairman of Joint Chief of Staff? Okay, and uh, so the, his cabinet prepares their portfolio folder and that kind of stuff that he gives it to the President Reagan. President Reagan takes it to Clemente in California at home, comes back the next day, opens his, his uh, board meeting and says, gentlemen, I chose Jack Vesey. Somebody wants to discuss it anymore. And no one discussed it. So Jack Vesey was the guy. So, so, he, so he goes into his Oval Office and he calls Jack Vesey and said, Jack, I want you, no, first of all, he calls him up and goes, Jack was working, most of the time the generals live on a base because they can be ready to hop and go. Okay, and uh, so he was at home and so he, he quickly changed into his military uniform, came into the Oval Office and the President said to him, Jack, I want you to be my chairman of Joint Chief of Staff. Jack was taken back, to be honest with you, but he didn't say anything. But then Mr. Reagan, tell me, very interesting, said, he's Mr. Ray, President Reagan at the time, said to Jack, he said, listen, I don't want you to give me an answer now. Go home and talk to Avis. Avis was his wife, okay? And then you can give me an answer. President knew what the hell he was gonna say. I mean, how can you say to the president if you begin with the chief of staff? But President Reagan was so smart and so politically connected that he didn't want him to give him an answer then. So Jack Vesey goes home to his base. He finds his wife, Avis, to be in the garden. She, she, was, she was already packing and she was, they were ready to retire. In fact, they turned in their retirement papers to, to President Carter and uh, they were ready to retire and uh, they probably another week or 10 days, they would have moved back to Minnesota where, they, where he came from. Um, so, President, General Wesley goes to Avis and said, honey, guess where I've been? He said, well, what the hell did you get into now? And uh, he said, President offered me to be a chairman of Joint Chief. He said, what the hell did you do that? You know, that's God's way of punishing you. What had happened was, Jack Vesey had lied to go into the military at 17. True story, okay? And, and this war was on, and the military was being called up, and he was, a, he was an army guy. He goes in to, to the recruiting office, sits down in front of the recruiter, and says, uh, uh, son, how old are you? He said, I'm 17. He said, no, 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 you're not 17. What I want you to do is go around the building, come back, sit down here again. When I ask you a question, just nod your head. So he goes around, sits down again, and, President, and the recruiter asks him, how old are you, are you 18? He didn't then lie, he just, just shook his head, that's all. So, so the recruiter said, you're in. 
So he got drafted at age 17. Uh, and so it was says, that was, that's God's way of punishing you, of lying to get into your army. True story. So things happen. Okay. Claude Romy was an excellent business person in Switzerland. I needed somebody from uh, Switzerland. I needed Ed Meese to advise me on the governmental issues. Jack Vesey to advise me on military. Claude Romy was, uh, was uh, um, a Swiss guy that I needed for his Swiss advice. And then Joe Freeman, he was a goof off, but a good guy. Okay, so you get those all the time. You know what I mean? You can't get them all perfect. Okay, so these were my people. They helped me a lot. They were like, like my fathers to me, if you will. And like I said, I didn't have the, uh, the opportunity to listen to my father for advice. Okay. Uh, so, so my fidelity technology succeeded and all that kind of stuff, and I was happy with it. Then I said to myself, Jack, you're getting old now. Old meant I was 62. I said, what the hell are you going to do with yourself now? I said, okay, I wanted to, my decision was, instead of selling my company, I would turn it over to my sons. Okay. And then I, I, thought, I made a plan to study on my sons. I planned to retire at 62, which was not to be, but I decided that I'm going to give my sons a try. My sons were now ready for prime time, so I sent them back to school to get an MBA. And uh, then I took a sabbatical in 2003 as a trial run to see if they could manage it when I'm away. And they did. So I retired in 2004 as a uh, sort of retired, uh, I don't know what the hell I was going to do, but I did. Okay. And uh, today, uh, Fidelity Technology is flourishing. It has about 850 employees, over 100 plus million in sales. Global, global company, does military work all over the world. Then I had retired, like I just said, I intend to. Then I said, what the hell am I going to do with myself? So I was in, uh, sitting nicely in, um, in Florida in my house, and uh, I get this literature in the mail saying, Stokes Air Castle is going up for auction. Some of you do not know Stokes Air Castle. Stokes Air Castle is an icon in Reading. It's a castle built by Reading Railroad Money in 1931. It was in bad shape, uh, but it was going up for auction. So I happened to be coming up this way. So I came up and I sat in the back row in the auction time. And uh, when the last guy was done, I raised my hand. So I won the bid. <laughs> I really did, you know. Now I have to do something with it. I didn't know anything about restaurant business. Like I told you, I was in government business, I was in electronics business, and all that. So my advice to you guys is, it doesn't matter what business you're in. You know, you don't have to learn the business itself. You can hire those people. And uh, so I bought the Stokes Air Castle, I put some money into it to renovate it, and it turned out to be a beautiful, beautiful investment. Then, about two years later, I bought a Sunnybrook ballroom, which is in Pottstown. Some of you may know Sunny Brook. Anybody you know Sunny Brook? There's one. Anybody else? There's one over there. Good. Anyway, Sunny Brook is an old, old establishment. It used to be the Big Band stopping ground in the old days. Uh, Big Band always stopped when they were going from uh, New York City to Cleveland. They stopped in Reading to play their music. And we have signs up there. All the Big Band you can think of uh, were there. Okay. So I bought that. Why? Because it was there. You know, okay. So therefore, I said, okay, I'm going to retire now for sure. This is the third try. Okay. So I turned my business over to my sons, and uh, and I then I said, I'm going to stay retired. Well, then the good fortunate or unfortunate happened. I got a stroke. Some of your parents may have had strokes. Some of you people may know we have had a stroke. I had a pretty bad stroke. Uh, for about 60 seconds, I was dead that when they took me in. But the lesson here is get health right away. My wife was there when I had my stroke, and uh, she called the ambulance right away. And uh, I was sleeping still, uh, and uh, so, so I got saved. And uh, you know, the, so the, my Reading Hospital gave me very good care. Oh, this is interesting. Um, this was a stroke where they cannot just give you a pill and recover from you. They have to go to your groin and into your brain. I had a blood clot in my brain, okay? And uh, it's pretty bad, it's pretty bad though. For 60 seconds, like I said, I could see my soul leaving me and uh, coming back to me after that, okay? Uh, 
Do you know, right now even, I don't have any long-term disabilities in the stroke, but I do miss out on some big words, okay? Uh, some of the words I just can't pronounce, whatever. I don't care how hard I try. It doesn't matter how much I try practice at home, and I'll give you an example in a minute. That I just can't do it, period. But that's, that, that's my long-term effect. If that's what it is, that's okay. I can live with it. I just, I just have to substitute easier words, and I'll explain to you in a minute uh, where, okay? Uh, then, after 2013, I just told you about my purchase of the hockey team in 2014. That's only a, a February after March uh, stroke. I decided to buy the damn uh, hockey team, which I made millions on. Uh, you know, and uh, I kept the team. My main purpose was to keep the team in Reading, which I did. Then in 2019, the city had grown a little bit. The, the, the county and the city formed a, a partnership to buy my team so they could keep the, the team in Reading. And that was my own objective for buying it anyway. So the, my total objective in the end was met that uh, the team stays in Reading and it is in Reading today and they're playing good hockey. Okay, I sold the team in 2019, five years later, and I was happy. Then I bought Allen Americans. Why did I buy Allen Americans? I'll tell you. Because it was there, and it was a good buy. That's another advice for you guys. You make money when you buy, not when you sell. So if you buy right, you, you, you can be pretty sure that you'll make money. Kathleen knows. She's bought 10 of them. She buys all kinds of real estate apartments. On a penny on a dollar, she sells them for 2%, two, 200% two of the dollar. That's Kathy for you. And she's our board chair, by the way. So you're in good hands. She's a, Kathy, stand up a minute. Let me introduce yourself to all the students here. No, seriously. Really. <laughs> Kathy is not only a smart person, she's a true, sure business lady. And on top of that, she's your board chair at the Chestnut Hill College. So you can be sure your college is in good hands. Really. So I bought the 2017, I bought the team, and I'm still losing millions on it, but that's okay. I started with good ones, you know? So what the heck, it's only money now. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you some uh, thing, life lessons. Balancing business and family, I've emphasized it many times, and I really mean that. Pay attention to your, uh, your, uh, your family life, your parents, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, you know, whoever, uh, and uh, uh, then I said, to, to, uh, getting involved in politics and professional activities, which is our job to keep make sure that America stays strong because of you people, that's in good hands. Uh, planning personal finances, I'll explain a little bit on that. Uh, planning for the future of your business. Then giving back. This is where I always have problem with this word. Fill a top, go. Did I, did I say it right? No. Fill a, fill, fill a topic. I can never pronounce the damn word. So my wife, yesterday, my, I was telling my wife about it. She had me practice 100 times. I couldn't give it. So I said, I just can't do it, honey. So I picked up another word, giving back. <laughs> it works, right? Okay, so giving back and the transition to retirement. Uh, business and uh, family life. Uh, you know, focus on business in the time allocated for business. When you're at work, devote your 100% to the work. Don't just goof off. Don't just sit chat in the, in, the, in the lunchroom and talk or in the, in the water cooler and talk about this or that. It doesn't do any good. Yes, you want to know what the baseball score was. You know how bad the Eagles beat the, the Dallas Cowboys. But that's a nice thing, but it's not their business time. You know, just pay attention to the business. That's your work. You okay? You fall asleep? <laughs> All right. Anyway, pay attention to work. That's your job there, and you're getting paid for it, though. So please do that. But then I said limit bringing business home work. You know, try not to take your business back to your home. You know, when you're home, you should be home. When you're in business, you should be at business. And pay attention to wherever you are, OK? Uh, you know, for me, <coughs> I can count on a handful the times when I took work home with me from uh, business 
and in the other, other handful, I probably opened my book maybe twice. I just prefer not to do it, you know. And then if I had to spend some time with my family, I will come back and work, spend my time with my, my sons or my grandchildren. And, uh, and then uh, I'll go back to work if I have to, to do whatever I need to do. And I said, create a visible transition from work to home. Uh, I learned this when I was in college. Um, we, we had a study to do on uh, our presidents, and I did a paper on uh, George Washington, uh, who was our first president. And he taught me a very good lesson. He said, Jack, you know, when I'm in the military, I have my uniform sitting by my front door on a hook. So when I'm home, I take that uniform off, and I'm in my home clothes. I'm the father and the mother, uh, father and not the mother, but close enough in, the, in those days, I mean those days. Anyway, just a father and a husband, okay? Um, and, uh, but when I'm at, when I'm at uh, work, I put my uniform on. So that was his way of changing clothes from one action to the other as a way of uh, saying to himself. Uh, the, the point here is, and of course, as you know, in, in military, you have to be ready in a matter of seconds. So that's why he used to hang his military uniform by the doorway, so whenever uh, uh, the, he's called on to the military action, he will strip off his uh, jacket and put on a military pants and, and shirt and be in the battlefront, okay? So what I do is, when I get home, I, I, I just yell, I say, honey, I'm home. I'll go upstairs and change my clothes, my business suit to monkey suit, do my small home thing, whatever I wear at home, you don't wanna know. But uh, anyway, um, that's what I look like. So I look like my shorts and all that kind of stuff. So that was my way of, uh, of uh, coming home. And uh, so then I would go in and kiss my kids and my wife and all that kind of stuff. And so I was at home as a father and a, and a husband. And so that was my way of doing things. You may have the other way of doing it, but the key is you need to find some kind of a switch that turns you from your work to your uh, family life, okay? And then the question that comes up is uh, uh, communicating with the next generation. I would not waste too much time on it because you guys are still young, and when you get older, you may need to communicate with your sons and your grandsons and all that kind of stuff. Um, so basically, it's a uh, way of communicating with your uh, next generations. Uh, my thinking has been is this. Whenever my grandchildren turn 12, Either I or my wife takes them out on a one-on-one -on -one trip to wherever they want to go. Me, I take the boys, and my wife takes the girls. Two of my boys, one wanted to go uh, freshwater fishing, other one wanted to go deep sea fishing. My daughter, one wanted to go to Paris, my granddaughter, one wanted to go to Paris, one wanted to go to Hollywood, where I was at one time, I went to be. Uh, just think though, if I was still, still a movie star, she would come to look at me. <laughs> eh? They're just going looking at all the other movie stars. But anyway, life didn't have that. So that's just a way of saying that uh, how do you treat your kids, okay? That's my other son that I took a deep sea fishing. Uh, so now it comes into the what does a, an entrepreneur does in civic and uh, political uh, activities. We all want to be involved, and I encourage you to be involved in civic and uh, political affairs. I joined the ROTC, then I ran for supervisors in a township, then I ran for uh, Congress and I lost. But the lesson learned is this, at local level you can do it, but at a national level you need lots of money. So the best thing to do is support the candidate that you believe in. So I was involved in this thing, okay. And uh, promoting small business interest, like I told you, I was in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, appointed by President Carter and Reagan to a small business, and I was Chamber of Commerce. So the reason I'm bringing that out again is this transition to Africa, to military, to civil rule. Uh, so I've been through all that stuff, okay, Chamber. But the key part is I learned a very important lesson. Entrepreneur, and I was spreading myself in the worst possible way, is sped out too much. I was sped out all over the world you can think of. Really, I was traveling to Europe almost every other week. I had businesses to attend. I was vice president of this, president of that organization. My philosophy now is that in uh, 2003, 
I gave up all those activities and started to concentrate on my business activities. And my business went like this, where I was doing this. But by the way, being in those uh, places was going through my head. How can you say to President Reagan, oh, I'm a big wig here because I want to tell you how to run small businesses. I think it's pretty, damn, pretty much a damn uh, ego abuse, isn't it? You know, how can you say to the president that uh, said, you want to go to Africa to help these uh, countries transition from military to civil? I mean, it's, it's a big stuff. And it goes through your head. And that's what happened to me. And uh, so obviously, I didn't do that. So my last ten thing is planning your, your finance. You need to plan your finances. It doesn't matter you're starting out with your first job or your third job. Just try to save a few dollars to yourself. My bigger lesson here is don't use credit cards. Please don't use credit cards that you can't pay the bills on at the end of the month. They're, they're ripoffs as can be. They charge 22% interest, and you'll never pay them off. You know, my thinking is, yes, use credit card that you're going to be able to pay off at the end of the month, but don't use credit cards to buy yourself a meal or a bar bill, something like that. Nothing wrong with buying heavy, heavy equipment you need, washer, dryer, refrigerator, furniture, because that's going to be with you for a while. But things that go away, don't do that. Don't do that, because uh, the credit cards are terrible for a young man. Okay? And uh, I developed develop a small plan as to what you're going to do with it. Think about life insurance as part of your plan, because uh, you know, you're in good health now, uh, and you're young, but uh, in 20, 30, 40 years, who knows what you're going to be like. So just do it now. It doesn't be very expensive. At your age, you can buy a million dollars for about $40 a month, something like that, even smaller. But do that if you can, OK? Uh, then plan for your future. It would take, if, you, if you had a business to go to, it would take a four to seven years to, to develop a succession plan and work on it, good suggestions, work with the professionals that you that trust, your lawyers, your accountant. Don't try to keep double bookkeeping. You know, I, I know a number of people that I've known in the past, they have a cash business and they hide the cash in their drawer. Don't do that, it's not worth it. Not worth it, it's a small dollars you're gonna save. You know there's an old saying, uh, Justice Sherman said, that you don't, you, no one has any obligation to pay the government any more taxes than the absolutely minimum they have to be. So yes, you want to minimize on the taxes that you pay the government, but don't try to keep double bookkeeping, say that uh, I'm going to save $10 here. You'll get caught sooner or later. But more importantly, it goes to your head. It goes to your head that you think, oh, I have another $10 in my kitty. I'm going to spend it. No, it's not your money. It's the tax money. So just give it to them. Just be, be a good citizen. Okay, um, have a personal desire, okay? And then, I told you I was gonna use the word giving family. My parents were always in the giving mode. My mother, um, after, after my father died, my mother lived on social security. That was her sole income. I didn't have much money in those days. Uh, and uh, she still uh, scraped up over uh, $5,000 to give to the Special Olympics. Why? Because I don't know how the hell she did it, but she saved pennies there, and dimes there, and she saved it. Then she built a house in uh, India for the holy men to travel so that they can go out there and do their worshiping, that kind of stuff. It's just a way of her giving back. Well, the, the, for, for us, um, we, we did whatever we could in our early years, and then um, um, we, we gave hodgepodge away. Then we decided to do a uh, foundation in 2002, and we gave a very small amount of money. And then over time, when we built it up, when I had more money to give, I gave it to my foundation. Today our foundation is about three million after giving away $4.5 million uh, to the charities. So this builds up. But the key part I'm trying to make here is, give it what you can, invest smartly, and uh, you'll be fine. But the key part is, though, keep going. Okay, some final thoughts. Only you can decide if you have a passion to be an entrepreneur. There's no better way to learn about business than from experience. You're going to fail. That's okay. I failed uh, 39 times, man. Just think of that, how, how, how bruised my, my ego was when I closed my business down that this business ain't going to make it. Okay? It was tough, but I did it, and then all of a sudden I'll get a double or single, then I'll get a home run and grand slams, and like I said, I, was, I had three grand slams, and that made me a decent person. Okay. 
There's no better way to learn to fund business than to experience and when you know you want to be an entrepreneur. Do your research on the kind of business opportunity you might pursue. Somebody asked me where should I go to pursue my opportunities. I said, well, don't worry about it. Just pick a spot. You want to, three or four things you look at. You look at uh, where you want to live. You want to live in a particular area. You want to go in a particular uh, uh, part of the country, Europe, wherever. No big deal. Everybody's there. You can make a business plan and uh, save money so that you can live on for six months before you go into business for yourself and uh, launch out on your own. And that's my family. You will never know the joy that comes from, be from being an entrepreneur and creating a legacy for your family unless you make it happen. Get going, enjoy the ride, my friend. That's <laughs> Andrew. Keep going. Oh, you guys are dynamite. You got the dynamite here. Okay, I have a few minutes for a question or am I over? I'd like you to uh, respond to a point. For those of you that all took my business law class, remember we talk about corporations, partnerships. You know when you talked about a shell corporation? Mm -hmm. Could you explain why that was important to do? Because it, was, I remember I talked, if you think back to our class, why was it important to have a corporation? Okay, first of all, corporation, as you all may know, it saves you from personal liabilities. Your corporation, that let's say that you start a business and you go belly up, it's not your responsibility, it's the responsibility of the corporation. Except, you gotta be careful, many times they make you personal guarantees, and uh, okay, give me a personal guarantee, but don't personal guarantee with a husband and wife. Just do yourself, you have nothing on your name. It's jointly owned between you and your wife. So, if you're married, that is, by the way, don't get married for that purpose. Okay, I mean, you know, don't, don't do foolish things, okay? And second thing, it, it, it saves you from a liability. But equally important to me anyway, is when I'm ready to do a deal, one of the things that I specialize in, I bought, um, I'm a bottom fisherman. I buy distressed companies uh, that are bad. And therefore, you have to move fast. You can't just simply say, oh, let me wait, let me take a month and uh, hire a lawyer and do the company and that kind of thing. I said, here's my company, when do you want to sign? And that, that has value in money. You know, your ability to move fast has significant value. So if you have a shell that's there, you can say, okay, I'm gonna buy you, but I'm gonna buy under my fidelity investment, so I'm safeguarded from a liability point of view, my house is safe, and uh, I can do the deal with it. It's like a currency to me. That's why I have a shell company. And I want, if you could go back in your PowerPoint, now okay, this way. I have to go this way. Hold on. Towards. And I'm talking to all my all my senior seminar students. Where do you have you? I'm looking for um, entrepreneur. What you when you have a business about what you have to save. Yeah. You remember where it is. If you remember his slide talking about a business that takes five to seven years? <clears throat> Sammy, all the rest of you, remember when you do your business plans, you come out and all of a sudden in year one, you made, a, you made money? Do you make money in year one when you start a business? Very rarely. Very rarely. This is someone that's done it. So you know when you do your Griffin Tank and you come forward and you're talking about your business plan? You're going to get slammed if you make money the first year. And here's someone that can tell you that it takes five to seven years to make money. There are all the questions I have. But you can, you know. So, but the key part is, yes. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your experiences. What advice would you give our students on balancing risk, because as an entrepreneur, you have to take risk, risk and fear, two poor little words? That's a good question, okay? Uh, risk is inherited in any business you do. You go work for a company as an accountant. I have a friend, he worked for the company for 28 years as a logistic manager. This past Friday, he got laid off. And no severance, no nothing. So he's out there on the street now. I mean, he, he's, he's a smart guy, he saved money and he had a good 401k. But just think for a minute though, he was there for 28 years they let him go with no severance. Said, you're out. So that's the risk. 
doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or you're working for somebody. Risk is inherited in life. You will face that. And I hope none of you have to face that kind of stuff, but it's always there. Okay, now how do you balance that risk? Well, you should start to save some, like this gentleman did. He's uh, 52 years old now, and he's gonna have a tough time. You know, he told me the other day, Jack, I, this, I had lunch with him yesterday, and he said, Jack, I worked for this company for 28 years. I'm a logistic manager. He manages over $100 million worth of logistics every year, and he got laid off, and now he has to go look for a job. And he's entrepreneur enough that he saved some money so he can meet his bills, but then he said, Jack, I had an interview yesterday to be a truck driver. I said, okay, what are you gonna do? That's your life. At 52, you're not gonna go hire a 20 year experience the thing. So it's a risk that you risk that you manage. In business world, I like to buy companies in the bottom, I'm a bottom fisherman, but you don't have to be. Many people make good money uh, with buying top and they make better by making it, making it even better. My philosophy is that's why I had 32 strikeouts because I bought sick companies. But on the other hand, when I made a sick company well, I was down here, then I ended up here. So just a matter of uh, individual choices. Yes? When you say you buy from the like, bottom of the barrel of companies, yep. how, and then you've got five to seven years to see if it makes profit, yep. how do you know when to sell it, like when, when it's not making profit? That, that's a good question. Okay, don't be afraid of selling the business. You know, every year you do your business plan and revise your business plan, and then see what the potential is. There are five things that you have to measure yourself with. Number one, of course, is your sales increasing. Number two, is your product still viable? Because your product, you may be making widgets that have disappeared, no longer needed in the marketplace. Number three, do you have the staff to, to make, make it happen? And number four is uh, your gut feeling. That's the biggest thing in most businesses. Your gut feeling, what do you feel in your guts? but you think this, this business will go, or you say, Jack, I'm tired of this thing. Let me try something different. Then either you close it down, you sell it, or uh, whatever. But the main thing is you evaluate every year where you are and where you're going. Okay? Yes? What do you think the most important lesson you learned about your failures that allowed you to hit the grand slam in the whole world? It's just a learning process, really, do you know? I mean, like at one time, I used to start companies. Now I don't start companies. I just buy sick companies. Like Allen American, for example. I mean, it was losing millions when I bought it. It's still losing money, but that's okay. Over the time when I sell it, I'll make some big money. So that's a home run then. You know what I mean? Because uh, I'll make up all the losses I've had. And I, I have to jokingly saying that you'd make millions when you start out with billions. But uh, the real life is you will make money over a period of time, you know, those kind of things. Uh, so answer your question is, uh, uh, you know, you just gotta stick with it. That's it, you just gotta do it. There's no easy answer. You know, when I get a home run, I know when I have a home run, meaning when I sell big times. You know, I don't know if you know the word EBITDA. Does any of you know EBITDA? You all do? Yeah, earning before interest, uh, de uh, depreciation and amortization, okay? That's what people measure you by. Your vendor, your supplier, your investing banker will look for EBITDA number. Is your EBITDA going up or down? Obviously, if it's going down, it's not so good. And uh, then you, you normally sell your companies based on your EBITDA multiple. You know, like in my case, for example, one of my home runs was I invented the emergency call system for older people. I've fallen down, I can't get up kind of thing. But it had a you know, feature into it if the feature was that had a fall detector into it. In other words, if you fall, it's going to detect you. Most people don't do that, okay? Uh, now, that, that business was hot in uh, 2007, and uh, I got 16 times multiple. You're lucky if you get three to four or five times multiple. It was just a good timing. So the answer to your question is, was the timing correct? Yep, sell it. You know, because I could see it another five years, 10 years from now, that market is going to stabilize, if nothing else. Yes? Uh, how would you recommend buying investing in your own business versus investing in your future? I'm sorry, buying your own business or what? So like, like if I'm starting my own business, so yep. how, would, how would you recommend investing for my future for the long term for retirement versus investing in a company now? Okay, uh, if I understand your question, 
Do you know, I have 11 grandkids. They are about your age, about 26 to 9. And most of them are in the 20s. Uh, I tell them this. I said, go work someplace for three years. Doesn't matter where, because you need some hands-on experience. Be it in the industry, be it in service, be it whatever. And then you think about starting your own business. Okay? And you can start just from scratch. I've, I've started some businesses when I already had other businesses and I was gainfully employed and I was getting a few dollars for my home, home life. Uh, and then uh, opportunity will come, uh, I will buy it. I prefer to buy than to start, but that's okay. You, you can do either one. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of uh, how you feel about it. But I think it's good to get a little experience after college to work for somebody else to get a good feel for uh, what that business is like. Somebody was telling me they want to be, it was you maybe, uh, they said I want to be, I'm going to be a carpenter. Is that you? Yeah. Okay. So you want to be a carpenter? Carpenting is a very good profession. You know, our Lord was a carpenter. Do you know him? Oh. Never mind. <laughs> I, I'm picking on you. I'm sorry. No. What I said was, our Lord was a carpenter. Do you know him? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, that, that's a separate topic. I'll discuss that next time, maybe. Okay. Uh, but uh, the point is, uh, go work for somebody for a few years. Get the experience, not only craftsmanship, but how he keeps his book, how he prices the product. You know, what does it take? I mean, uh, does he estimate by the hours and then multiplies it by a certain number of dollars per hour or materials and all that kind of stuff? The biggest mistake we make is that our cost is always more than we estimate. You know, on anything, really, it doesn't matter what business it is. Uh, but uh, the key is just go do it. And, you know, you go on your own. There's nothing wrong with it. No, you're not going to go, you, in your age set, the worst thing would be is you will learn by your own experience. That's not so bad. You know, the, you may lose a few dollars or may lose a few, few uh, you know, this or that, but. Yeah, I'm sorry, you had one more? With all the businesses that you've owned over time, when you had your stroke or you became ill, was there, any, was there a certain thing that you regretted not doing or wanted to do more when you came forward, like, like out of that? Uh, when I had my stroke, I had retired. Pretty much, but uh, that was a uh, stroke of time, more than anything else. There was no sign before that. But was there like a, a business opportunity or something that you like regretted not going for or not doing? No, no, I just had a stroke. I wish I didn't have it, but my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. I still, I, I do have a lapse of memory. Uh, in the old days, I used to remember the names of the people like that, just like that, because uh, the key, to, the key to remembering the name is when you introduce to them, repeat it. You know, hi, John. Hi, Sam. Hi, what was your name, Dom? Dick. Dick, close enough. <laughs> Dick starts with D. You know how that is, right? But anyway, it is to repeat it. Now I repeat it, but I lose it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guy. No, you're, but, good. you're good? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Good question. Very good question. Well, the last thing you want to do is if you sell your business or you give it to your sons or keep it in the family, once you do make that transition, get the hell out of there. <laughs> get the hell out of there. They'll do their own mistakes. If they come to you with some advice, give them advice, but don't tell them to do it. You know, my sons they, in the early years, they came to me for advice, and I gave them advice. Sometimes they followed, most of the time they didn't. But that's okay, uh, you know. But now, seriously, just to get out of there, you know that I learned that from Ed Meese. Like I told you, Ed Meese was Attorney General of the United States. He's the biggest uh, chief uh, lawyer position in the in the country in the world, for that matter. He told me, he said, Jack, uh, when I left, when uh, President Reagan lost, or no, didn't didn't win the re-election, I'm sorry. He won two terms, and when his term was over, uh, he went through hell. The politicians are terrible on you, believe me. And he didn't do anything wrong, but make a long story short, they put him to this inquiry, that inquiry, and on and on and on. What we have nowadays is nothing. 
But make the long story short, he was cleared of everything. He said, Jack, when the President Reagan left on January 20th at 12, 12 noon, I went, I went to my office, I said goodbye to the, for five minutes to four people. Then I went over and had uh, lunch with my wife. Then I went to Heritage uh, Foundation where I was going to work from there on. So that was the transition from one to the other. And I do the same thing. I do the same thing. I turn my business over to them. I said, boys, this is yours. Just pay me. That's all I, that's all I do. You know? And I, by the way, I don't give them any mercy. They pay full price. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got to live, you know, man. You know? It's their problem now. They don't have any money. Not mine. But anyway, the answer to your question is, just get out of there. Get out of the way. Let them do their mistakes. And if they come to you for advice, uh, that's exactly what I did. Every time I sold their business, either I sold it to my family or to the outside. I never wanted a consulting contract. I never wanted to stay with them. I just simply say thank you, goodbye. It's your job. Now, if you need me for some advice, I'll be happy to give it to you free of charge, but buy me a cup of coffee. But then I said, hey, coffee isn't enough. Buy me a good soft drink. <laughs> Big time, baby. I drink a lot. OK. Anything else? OK. Oh. What would you say to your parents if you had the opportunity to tell them where you are today? That's a good question, though. It's a good question. Of course, my father died at age 52. My mother died at age 65. And uh, so I didn't have that uh, long-term relationship with them. I wish I had, but it is what it is. Uh, I think they will roll over in their grave and say, Jack, where the hell you been? Why can't you hold a job? <laughs> my, my father would all the time. He worked for one company for 30-some years, and I, I switched companies every two weeks, like underwear. You know, approximately, not every two weeks, every couple of years. Uh, so answer your question is, uh, they would be proud of my achievements, but they would say, why do you make it so hard on yourself? But that's, that's okay, though. But that's, that's the way life is. You know, not, there's, no, there's no easy way. And there's no smooth way. And by the way, there's no right way or the wrong way. What's right for me, like I said, I, I like to go from job to job. Many, many kids who work for the one company for the rest of their life, like this young man I was telling you, for 28 years, he graduated from high school. They never went to college. Worked for this company for 28 years, and then got laid off last week. What are you going to do? You know? Anybody else? Okay. Hey, thank you for all coming. Enjoy yourself. All right. Before everyone leaves, I just want to say thank you. Not just yet, guys. Can't go home. I just want to say thank you so much for everyone coming for the spring seminar for uh, 2023. That concludes it. Um, and as a gift to Mr. Galati, we wanted to give him this for coming with all of us today, Mr. Oh, what is this? It's a bottle of wine. A oh, bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> you said you like Oh, man, Justin, that's a high end, guys. <laughs> Who wants to have an auction on this? <laughs> uh, who wants to bid? Do have four of Jack's books? So if any of you want them and would like them to autograph them, they're here. Thank you. The first four get them. Thank you very much. Now you can all leave. <laughs>